Welcome to another insightful episode of The Textual Talk. I'm your host, Unri, and we got our co-host today, Destiny, rocking with us. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that weighs heavily on many minds in the job search process. In this episode, we tackle the tough questions and share practical advice on navigating the often daunting journey of job hunting, particularly in the tech and cybersecurity fields. We discuss why finding a new job can take anywhere from three to six months or longer. We'll also explore the critical role of networking, strategic planning, and resume optimization. You'll hear us debunk the myth that applying to countless jobs increases your chance of success, and we emphasize the importance of focusing on relevant positions and tailoring your applications. Unre sheds lights on the benefits of obtaining entry-level positions at reputable companies that offer tuition reimbursement, while Destiny shares her personal journey of entering cybersecurity through a master's degree program. We'll also address the controversial topic of job training programs, certifications, and whether they are worth your time or money. We'll chat about quality engagement on LinkedIn, building a robust personal brand, and leveraging connections to find referrals to the jobs that you want to apply to. Whether you're just starting out, contemplating a career change, or looking to climb that ladder in your current field, this episode is brimming with valuable insights and tips to help you succeed. So don't forget to follow us, leave a comment, and enjoy the podcast. All right, man. This is late night live stream. Let me open these comments up and um, have people put a one if they can see us. Decided to go live today. We've been so busy. I was like, we ain't gonna have a lot of time to pre-record this joint this week. I was like, let's just go live on the nights that we record late. And then just see if, you know, that carves out a little late night tech show for y'all. And and we'll go with it like that. But if y'all not familiar with us, I am HD. I'm a cybersecurity professional, content creator, podcaster, career coach, you name it. And we got our co-host right here. Let's see if she's going to list our accolades or not. NA, I'm just kidding. Hi, guys. I am Cyber Shorty, a.k.a. Destiny. I'm also a security professional. Um, I'm really, I'm that girl. That's it. She forgot that she's like a a professor. I am. I do. I teach at a local community school, um, cybersecurity there. I write books. I do a lot. Jack of all trades. Bet, bet, bet. <laughs> Somebody say you got some people here. Surprise stream. Yeah, man. I'm, um, so right now we are streaming live on YouTube and Twitter. So uh, if you can comment wherever you're watching from, let us know. And like I said, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe, bell icon and everything. And for the people that's eventually going to hear this on Spotify or, you know, Apple Podcasts or whatever, leave us a review, comment. Y'all know what to do. And whatever you did to your light and destiny, it did make you like look darker. Like it was perfect early. I don't know what happened. Okay, let's, let's like a light bulb that. went out or something. But uh, while Destiny is trying to figure out her lighting, um, I'm pretty sure most of y'all just watched the uh game one of the NBA finals. And of course the home team won. Uh I don't think it's still gonna say like just because Boston won game one that they're going to take the whole thing. So we just got to say, I think it's a good series. Uh, Dallas fought back I think within like 10 or nine. And then, you know, Boston will let them get back, like catch back up to like even tie. So that's good. They stayed on their neck. So in this series, I possibly see at least for the first four games, both teams protecting home court. Uh, so I can see this probably going six or seven. Uh, but, you know, I, mean, I don't got no horse in the race. I probably would rather. You know, I ain't really got nothing against Jason Tatum, but I think I want Kyrie to win another one just because I feel like he was done wrong for stuff that he really didn't do that bothered anybody. So, yeah, uh, go Mavs. Good game one for the Celtics. And, you know, it's a long series. You know, best of four. So, briefly, it is, uh, what, Friday's Eve? <laughs> well, and some Friday people, Eve, it's sure. already Friday for them if they're on the East Coast. And you no, know, on on Thursday nights, that's when like our our good shows drop. So of course you got shot the shy, and then Power is back today. So we're not gonna go on a super long tangent for that. I'm I'm definitely waiting to see what they plan to do with Tariq and Noma, 
and uh what's what's the girl name that tell all the secrets? Mm, no. What girl? Monet daughter. I can't think of her oh, name. Oh, uh, I can't think of her. She <laughs> Oh, what is her name? Diana. Um, Diana. 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 Yeah. Diana, Diana, Effie, Kane, Drew. I'm ready for Tyreek and Kane. I know. I love Kane. I'm ready for Kane to see how he finna act this season. The most hated. Probably dumb as usual. Absolutely. Man. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all good. And then you got, uh, real quick before we get into the text stuff, the latest episode of Shy is coming up. Now, there's a fan theory where people think that Keisha's baby daddy is not that man that uh that died that kidnapped her. They think it's Nook. I forgot about that depressing entire season where she was trapped in that house. Like it was just such a tough season to get through. It was, but it's possible that it could possibly be Nook, because you know she was texting him when she got abducted. Yep. She was, and you know the baby is fair skinned too. So now that would be that would be a situation for sure. I'm I'm into the shot this season. It's it's been pretty consistent. It, it hasn't been any like, uh, why did they make that episode? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's been like I said, compared to um, yeah, I guess some show put show the camera in a second, but compared to BMF, it's been like I said, a breath of fresh air. And I, had, I meant to send you the screenshot earlier because I was laughing at it. It says uh, T telling Spence how him and Meech is spending the Crenshaw after they get back to uh, Mexico. Let me see. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, bro, they be killing me with this stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, I guess I'll let you get into your your first topic about um, the risk of paying ransomware. That's what you want to get into real quick. Let's see. Yes. So the title of this article is Panda Buy Pays Ransom to Hacker Only to Get Extorted Again. So Panda Buy is an online platform that acts as an intermediary between customers and various Chinese e-commerce websites. It allows users to purchase products from those websites, which are often cheaper or have unique items that may not be available somewhere else, and they can pretty much get it shipped to their location. So on March 31st, a threat actor using the alias Sanagerio published 3 million rows of data stolen from Panda Buy on breach forums. And so they expose customer names, phone numbers, email addresses, log on IP addresses, home addresses, and order details. The threat actor claimed that they managed to steal the data by exploiting several critical vulnerabilities in the Panda Buy API. The data was shared with the data breach notification service, Have I Been Pawned, which added 1.35 million email addresses from the incident to its system. So on June 3rd, the same threat actor offered to sell what he claimed was the entire database that he previously stole from Panda Buy for 40,000. It allegedly contained 17 million rows, indicating a much larger data set. Um, but the spokesperson for Panda Buy said that they paid the bad actor a undisclosed amount to stop the data leak, adding that the threat actor may have shared the data with others so they would no longer cooperate with him. Um, so Bleeping Computer reached out to the bad actor about the company's statement, but it's not heard back. For now, it is better to take an abundance of caution and be on the lookout for unsolicited messages from people claiming to be panda by. So what do I think of that? I think it's funny. I was talking to my brother the other day and he said he thinks it's funny how someone can pretty much punk you for your stuff and you pay them for it and you still not get your stuff back. And that's exactly what happened in this incident. And that's what happens a lot of the times, which brings up the fact of should you pay ransomware? What is the risk that you take if you don't pay the ransom? Yeah, so the risk is the fact that you incentivize people to keep stealing from you. 
it's or it's asking like, for more money right so like when you're dealing with kids in school let's say like they keep on getting in the fights or something you got a, a kid that's not gonna fight back or some whatever they're gonna keep on picking on them because they're not protecting themselves so eventually you're gonna say all right one or two things gonna happen they're gonna keep on bullying you or you're gonna either punch them or you're gonna pick some up and you're gonna you know knock them out and usually when you bully the bully they leave you alone so in this case you got to protect yourself your company's data make sure you got good some good backups figure out how they got in if you can do away with that you know there was a I read an article for a company where they hit one of their clients where they got hit with ransomware it was a manufacturing company and so they had backups on hand they worked uh with makeshift like paper templates for a while eventually i think what three or four months after that you know they got them a more secure cloud environment and it was good to go so sometimes you just got to bite the bullet because it's like if you keep on like and them this is going to incentivize everybody else to come at you and like ain't nothing you could really do about it either except either fortify your systems <laughs> or uh, keep on trying to like uh share out the money share out the money granted Sometimes it's not on you. It's, it's on those third parties like we've been seeing this whole year so far. For sure. I think it's just insane how you can get punked and someone be like, give me that. I'm not giving. No, someone took your stuff and they said, I'm not giving it back until you pay me some money. You pay them the money and they say, eh, I think you should give me a little bit more. If you already can give me what I asked for, and why you can't give me a little bit more? And then that might just continue on to be a cycle. Now, that obviously doesn't happen every time, but that is one of the risks that you do take when you do pay the ransom. Or you can get a key that's not even the key. So they tricked you. They finessed yeah. you. <laughs> it's a like lot of finessing going on in the cyber industry, for sure. Yeah. I went, I, listen, I wouldn't even put it past them to say it's some like, backhanded like stuff that people letting happen you know for real like on the low just so you can't like uh just so you can keep job security we just call this thing like job security oh for sure so, Some gotta keep breaking so tax keep happening somebody's money this company right here that comes in and, and deals with uh incident response and all these different retainers that keep money when you take five steps back something's going on so, I mean, if everything was good, you wouldn't even have a need for these companies. So, I mean, that's a cynical I'm, way of looking at it, but it's one of the things that I, I actually do believe. And I'm, I, I'm interested in understanding more about cybersecurity insurance because yeah, I, been, I, I know they're not going for that, you know, like multiple attempts. Even if they're going for it once, they're not going for that twice. Right. And you know what? You actually got a good not good mindset on it, but expertise in this because that's the industry you used to work in and mm -hmm. insurance. Yeah. You know all about people probably doing multiple claims or insurance. Like, look, you having too many wrecks. We're not going to pay you any more for any of no, that stuff. We kick, that we're on. kicking you out. We're yeah. kicking you out. You go find someone else. That's exactly what they'll do. Once you start acting too crazy with the, um, with the claims, once they start getting too excessive or anything that's suspicious, like, why have you been in 10 accidents this year? What is going on? You're too <laughs> risky for us. Yeah, I've seen that. Then look, insurance be a thousand plus dollars a month. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know. Matter of fact, this is just a random question. You were doing claims though. So were you able to see like what people's like insurance was like per month and stuff? Or were you doing like houses? No. Or were doing, what were you dealing with? Uh -uh. Cars. Okay. People getting hurt. Yeah. Now we don't get to see any of that or didn't get to see any of that. Any, any recollection, like we don't even care <laughs> how much your, your, your insurance is. We just trying to figure out who was in the car and what happened. Yeah, yeah. So I want you to touch on the snowflake incident. Cause that's the big one. Funny enough, one of my followers where we follow each other on Twitter actually just made a post about uh, Snowflake may possibly be like one of the bigger breaches that no one's talking about. <laughs> and he reposted it, with that um, conceited gift. And so I want you to touch on it. And then I read my Snowflake article and then we can like talk a little bit more about it. OK, so the title of this particular article is hundreds of Snowflake customer passwords found online are linked to info stealing malware. So a 
Snowflake is a cloud data analysis company, and obviously they're at the center of an alleged data theft. Um, so its corporate customers are scrambling to understand if their stories of cloud data, excuse me, their stores of cloud data have been compromised. Snowflake does help some of the largest global corporations. So if you think about banks, healthcare providers, also tech companies, and they're storing and analyzing a ton of their data, um, such as their data in the cloud. So last week, Australian authorities sounded the alarm saying they had become aware of successful compromises of several companies that were utilizing Snowflake environments. Um, so they didn't provide the name of the companies, but hackers had claimed on a known cyber cybercrime forum that they had stole hundreds of millions of customer records from Santander Bank and Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster was just breached what, last week. Two of Snowflake's biggest customers, Santana, Santander confirmed a breach of a database hosted by a third-party provider, but would not name the provider in question. On Friday, Live Nation confirmed that its Ticketmaster subsidiary was hacked and the stolen database was hosted on Snowflake. Uh, Snowflake did acknowledge in a brief statement that it was aware of potentially unauthorized access to a limited number of customer accounts without specifying which one, but they found no evidence that there was a direct breach of its systems. Uh, but despite the sensitive data that Snowflake holds, they do let each customer manage the security of their environments and they don't automatically, here's the kicker, enroll or require its customers to use MFA. Um, so bye. Uh, not enforcing the use of MFA appears to be how cyber criminals allegedly obtain huge amounts of data from some of their customers. Uh, so, yeah, that is really just a quick summary of what happened. Um, insane. Here we go again. Another story of somebody not having MFA implemented. Yeah, I wish I could play like another one of Vice to Dust. Um... Another one bites the dust. Wow, wow. The funny thing, what I do know about Snowflake is so they've hired two of the, the big guns to pretty much look at their whole environment. I want to say they got Mandiant. That's mm -hmm. pretty much Google Cloud now. And they also, I believe, have CrowdStrike. You can fact check me on that one if anybody in the comments is familiar with what's going on here. But yeah, we are, we're always, it's always coming down to uh, MFA. I'm, I'm so yeah, go ahead. MFA. I'm so over. I'm over talking about MFA every week and how somebody doesn't have it implemented. It should be a requirement for all users for the 15,000th time we've seen this year. Just make it a requirement. And that's one less thing you have to worry about. Yeah. So I was going to also say what my, was, well, actually, the irony in all this is like, I have an episode I did on identity and access management. And one of the quotes that JK said on there was like how credentials and everything is always at the center of like every attack. And that's what you always see when, when these accounts get popped. It's like MFA and whatever way. I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty interesting on what they did to actually uh, breach Snowflake and pretty much get everybody because they got some some notable companies in there. And um, I wanted to read like one of the companies who allegedly Data is for sale is advanced auto parts. And I'm actually going to talk about them in a second. And I was going to tell you, Destiny, I think you had this option to do this too, but you can present um, at the bottom. So you don't have to uh, just read like that. Let me try to zoom in for people so they can see too. So... It says that a uh, major U.S. automotive aftermarket parts vendor, Advanced Auto Parts, had three terabytes of data containing sensitive customer and employee details claimed to be stolen by the threat actor, dubbed Spider, following the compromise of his Snowflake cloud storage environment, reports Bleeping Computer. So, including in a trove of information being sold for $1.5 million is 380 million customer profiles, 140 million customer orders, 44 million loyalty gas card numbers, data from, man, they got everything. <laughs> Employment, candidate uh, details and transactions, tender data, according to Spider. Other Snowflake customers were also, oh, other Snowflake customers were also alleged by the threat actor 
to have had their data exfiltrated since the intrusions began <sighs> mid-April. <laughs> mid-April. And so the intrusions began then. They probably was in, shoot, February. But have since paid the demands of their attackers. Such a development comes after both recent breaches of Ticketmaster and Santander Bank, like you just said, were linked to compromised Snowflake accounts with the cloud storage firm attributing the incidents to the targeting of organizations without MFA. Yep. So that's pretty much what you were saying, too. It's crazy. I'm just here to say, you yourself, make sure you got MFA enabled wherever you can have it enabled. At. This is insane. It's in. It cost hackers, bad actors, whatever you want to call them. It cost them so much more to try to compromise your account when you have MFA enabled and enforced. So keep that in mind. And we'll be here probably the next time talking about another MFA story for sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird because it's like Snowflake should mandate that. But it's also on the companies like, hey, we need to make sure we have that mandated. But even when you have MFA enabled, they still get popped sometimes because if you have it set up to where it's sending you pushes, if they have the right credentials, they're just going to keep on putting them in until somebody hit yes. Yep. We we see that all the time. Then at, so basically the user isn't reporting the MFA request is fraud. Right. Because think about it. Sometimes they're doing, I mean, they're not going to do it when you're alert. A lot of these times they're doing, they're trying to lock into your account when you're sleeping. Like they're thinking about a time you may be asleep or something. So you roll over and you see, it's like, dang, I don't recognize this. So. I mean, it's not a foolproof. Absolutely not. But, you know, better to have it than not have it. Right. Right, right. So. I think the funner one that uh, we got a lot of people on Twitter here on um, the live stream is we can actually talk about this job search thing. And I think it popped off when um, Bees kind of quoted this. So Mr. Cowboy Gripper says he got laid off June 1st, 2023. He created a spreadsheet to track all the roles he's applied to. A year later, he submitted 460 applications. So B says, this is less than 10 applications a week. I recommend people to apply to 10 jobs a day if possible. And this, this like, let me see something. If we got any like interesting quotes right here. <laughs> These are people y'all buying, getting the tech courses from... What's that got to do with anything? At the point like that what? 463 job application is not enough to find one job. We need to have a serious conversation about where the responsibility lies. Because it's not what the people having to fill out 463 applications for does. Well, after about 100, if you've never gotten an answer, it's not, it's probably your resume. I'm going to tell you that straight up. If you it, didn't it, get one. Resume. Not one? It's not your one. resume. It, yep, yep, yep. You're probably not talking about yourself in the best way. You're not illustrating your skills in the best way. You're not telling the best story about what you actually know and what you're capable of doing. Yeah. Right. Because I know I have a video. I said 100 jobs told me no, and it was actually more than that. But I interviewed for a lot of those roles. It wasn't just like I applied to like 100 plus and, um, you know, only heard back from two. I heard back from a lot. Because we're going to talk about this a little bit more in detail, but you can't just apply, spray your spray and pray your way to everything. Like you need to be strategic. If you're going to apply to a lot of jobs, apply to a lot of jobs that fit your skill set and not just applying to something because you need something. Or if it's one of the BS jobs, you just need to get a job to be on your feet. Like you got to go work at the gas station, a Target, or retail, whatever. Go on there and go holler at the manager. You're going to have to do something different. If you apply to that many, ain't nobody said something. You need to ask yourself, like, what is going on? And good thing is, I do got content on this channel that's about like stuff like that with your resume and and different things that you need to do to possibly be seen by recruiters. So it's more so on you than them, especially if it's bad. 
Yeah. And try to be, like you said, applying to jobs that are kind of similar, like so that you can use that one resume. Because if you're applying for something that's vastly different, if you're applying to be a pen tester, but you got just only help desk stuff on there, you're not telling the best story. Right. And um, goodbye to the worst website online. <laughs> he got to be talking about Twitter. We are still pretending that applying for a job involves sending off your CV as opposed to answering multiple essay questions and sending a cover letter to see if you get a telephone interview, to see if you get a technical assessment. That's not all the way true. You have easy apply. You have a lot of AI tools now that will help you. Like, for example, if you use a tool like Teal, Teal, I know we're trying to work on some. If you're listening right now, come spin the block. Teal, if you have your resume inside of Teal on certain job applications, it'll fill everything out for you. And then if you have a good enough resume, when you upload it, it's going to pretty much parse everything. So you may have yep. to answer 15, 20 questions in total. Some, sometimes you just upload the resume and hit submit. So you can do it. You got All you got to do is you could probably spend, my tips is to either apply late at night or early in the morning, maybe take an hour or two and apply. Now for the jobs you really want to have like success in, you need to tailor some things on your resume or if you got some highlighted bullet points, like swap them out and apply like that. And that's just the first part. That's just applying. We're not even going to get into some of the other stuff that I'll say uh, you need to do. Uh, my boy Jermaine said, folks are coming at the bees for pointing out what works. I get it. It's not right or fair that people have to go through this to get a job. But the reality is this. It's what works right now. Two things can be true and bees ain't a villain for being real. I agree. I mean, people think it's, it's again, it's just, a, it's not just a walk in the door. You're not going to just walk in here and make six figures. Like, it don't work like that. You need to put in the time. And half of that is just getting the interview. Yeah. The funny thing is, she said the dude in the main tweets really, like, kind of thanked her for her advice. So, it's like, you know, you can't please that. And since... um. Let me see. Since we are on this topic, I'm going to go right here. This is not it. Okay. This is not it. Oops. Hang on. Let me open it. I thought that was the tweet. Let me present it real quick, y'all. I just can't. I think it's this I one. Can't. Okay. So I don't even know what she does, but she said, my job 100% asked me to post jobs that they already have chosen a person for to make it appear we have equitable hiring practices. I think that's what a lot of companies are doing. And this is, is true. That is what they're doing. <laughs> they do this a lot. Like, but I they have to. People. Yeah. They have to legally post it. They have to. And so I don't think it's illegal for them to know or have an idea of people that they're interested in. They still, at the end of the day, have to interview. They still have to have a good interview. You know, they still have to meet the qualifications, requirements, whatever it is. But that is, that's the, that's why it's who you know. That's the whole, that's why. That's why people say that. It's not what you know, so it's who you know. It's what you know too still, but it's who you know, for sure. Yeah, and I've heard this on the horse's mouth from a director. It's like, you know, if a job comes open, a lot of times they're probably going to move it internal, but they got to post it to say they posted it based on whatever yep. they got to do. So unfortunately, it don't always be like that, but it'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> but and, the um, post kind of is given like maybe they knew somebody who was beneficial or, you know, if you're in that circumstance and you feel like, you know, a candidate that it's equally as good and advocate for them. That's simple. I mean, sometimes out of you know, sometimes out of your hands because you know when it comes to getting hired, everybody got to say yes in that loop. So it's like, do you waste time on the external person that we know we got to pay more, or this internal person that we finna get for a discount that we know can do the job? So that's that's pretty much what it is. But. What I also want to talk about is now. So we saw the thing the dude said he's like he applied to like 
four hundred, what, fifty three, sixty three jobs, something like that. So <laughs> somebody said they scamming people <laughs> on LinkedIn <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> hey, sometimes they do. Some sometimes uh the them not real postings. Uh if you really serious about the job, go see if it's open on the actual career site of the company. If not, Facts. and a lot of times the same job that's on a career site would actually be on the company's like LinkedIn page as well, too. And so you can kind of try to verify that way. Hopefully. Keyword is hopefully. So. I want to share this. I know uh, I only got a couple articles left for it. It's just the article I found. It was like a, a article I saw earlier. And it was like, it typically takes somebody, a job seeker, three to six months to find a new job. I would say a little oh, bit longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. This this market is different. I don't know. And this is the thing, too, that I do like to say with data. As I said on the last episode, just because that's what the data says, that don't mean it's telling the whole story. We don't know what career fields or what these people are in so it's not absolute that say that's what it should take for now if they encompass everything that's been going on in 2024 they may say three to eight three to ten months i've, I've seen I would say nine to twelve yeah depending on what you know and especially the i think for me a lot of the people i've been seeing are kind of more so early in career or they are like well into their career, senior level type of role. So that makes it difficult. Both of those. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the, that's actually one of the comments that I had earlier. I was like, for a person who have a lot of experience, they got to play the numbers game and, and exactly. just try to, yep. try to get in where they fit in for just, if you're going to go strictly up for applying, but there are easier ways. You just got to build up your network. So this thing says the latest data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reveals that job seekers who apply for 21 to 80 jobs have about a 30 percent chance of receiving the job offer. Paradoxically, it was found that the candidates who apply for more than 81 jobs reduced their prospects with a 20 percent chance of receiving the offer, according to job search website uh, Zipia, which I can see that if you're not focused like I said, if you're just applying for any and everything, that's what you'll be doing. Just clicking on any easy apply, anything to get another app crossed off the list. Yeah. yeah. And I could tell you from experience as being a career coach, when I sat down with my clients and saying, no, OK, what have you applied to? Or we do a consultation. And I'm saying, what job? What's the recent job you applied to? And I'm looking at your resume versus the job you applied to. I said, one of two things, you don't have these skills or they're not listening on your resume, but this is why you're not getting called back. So I told them, I said, hey, you're going to be more successful if you apply to stuff that it looked like you could possibly do. But if you're trying to apply to all this other stuff, but you don't have no projects, you got no skill sets, none of this other stuff, they're not going to call you back, fam. No matter how yeah. good your resume look. And that's why I'm a person that also really fixates on the contents of your resume versus just having a nice looking resume it's like going to get a o2 crown vic and putting a new uh paint on the body but the motor bad you ain't okay. finna go nowhere but around the block and then it's gonna stop and pretty resumes is really out of style unless you finna hand it to somebody in person it needs to be as simple basic as possible well no i'm not even talking about that like for example you're trying to be a security analyst but your jobs are, you know, you were a stalker at you know, Walmart and then after yeah. that, you were <laughs> um, asset protection like for three years. Don't get me wrong. You can get in a certain type of way. But if that's all you got, you got no certifications, you got no projects. You no projects. Money, yeah. No CTFs. You, yeah. I can, it I, looks I, insane. I can make but it you seem don't, like you Go ahead. But, but you don't know what you don't know. So now that now that you know, you know. There's some you can put something in there. You can go on the website, do a couple courses. You you can illustrate those skills even if you haven't been hired somewhere to do them yet. Yep. And I definitely can make like I can make it look good. I can make it sound like you a supervisor and you a manager and all this other stuff. Now listen, if you do want to finesse some 
All right. Just tell them you work cybersecurity at Circus C or Payless, Kmart. <laughs> like, them places ain't open no more. So if you want to tell them that you did it there, then by all means, tell them. Someone in the comments said that they have never um, heard anything back from Easy Apply. So they fill out the whole application. They'd rather fill out the whole application. Right. Right. So let's get back to the article. It says, therefore, applying for too many jobs can be self-defeating because although it appears that you're exposing yourself to more opportunities, it actually may diminish your chances of being hired. If you apply to hundreds of jobs, especially within a short space of time, such as two or three months, there's a high probability that you have merely skimmed through applications, click easy apply button, and not be able to give each one intense or quality tailored effort. Keep your gaze fixed on a number of applications as though it were the numbers game is misleading. Because the more you apply for, the more you reduce the quality and energy you put into your applications. And unless you're able to sell yourself to employees, which is what we talked about. And I think this is kind of this this title may sum up how Buddy was feeling. Destroys your mental health. Applying for roles in the panic apply mode ruins your mental health due to the sheer number of low quality applications you're sending. You could be sure to expect a significant rejection rate via rejection emails and even ghosting comparable in proportion to the number of applications you've sent out. This can cause depression, stress, and anxiety as you notice that the harder you try, the deeper you sink into the quicksand of un unemployment. Receiving a large number of rejection emails in quick succession can injure your self-esteem and confidence and make it harder for you to have the energy to project a strong personal brand image to the next employer. I think so, I love the part where they said, um, um, I feel like it's like you, once you get all those rejections, you start to get like rejection fatigue, like, or you become, mm -hmm. um, okay, whatever next. And like, you don't think and stop. Okay. I got 57 rejections. I need to pivot. I need to do something different because it just becomes so normal for you. Desensitized from those rejections. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I've been through that, especially when I was, uh, I wasn't getting a lot. Mine was different because I was going through processes or knowing I was a good fit and they didn't want to pay. I know for a fact, a lot of them didn't want to pay me at the time when I should have been getting paid for some of the roles. I already knew how I was going. They never mm -hmm. would never say it. Or like I said, if we want to be, you know, more nuanced uh, as being black people, sometimes you've been into like back in the day, I'm talking about suited and booted, going into the interview with a panel of none more white people. Just like, I feel like I ju I'm just here to be their diversity interview person. Or their personality Cause, higher. Because the people will be laughing at the jokes, you'll be answering stuff good. And then all of a sudden, in two weeks, yeah, they decide to go with somebody with more experience. I'm like, you knew my experience before I got the role, and this role don't require for that much experience. So what you talking about? Yep. Let's say you found somebody that's a better fit. Don't give me. I just do not like that experience piece because that's some bull. Because if you decide to interview me, don't tell me that. Because you Cause can you know for no recruiting call. Uh, you don't want me. Exactly. Or my resume. Now, guys, this is what we alluded to earlier about networking. And let's see what they got to say. According to Zip, uh, Zipia, 80% of hires come through networking, not scouring through job boards. Recent estimates also show that 70% of jobs are not posted on widely used job sites, which is a fact. I have this in my ebook. While Deloitte, while Deloitte reveals that individuals will need to find others who can help them get better faster, small work groups, organizations, and broader and more diverse social networks. Therefore, it makes more sense to focus on building the quality of your applications and network instead of the mere quantity of applications. So. They nailed it on the head. Let's see if they got anything else that I have, kind of haven't told anybody already. Uh, well, I guess we can go ahead and go through the whole article for people. Build your personal brand on LinkedIn. Focus on completing your LinkedIn profile and establishing yourself as a sought-after candidate on LinkedIn. Make your profile tailor show your career story and contribute meaningless insight. Hey, they stole this from my ebook. <laughs> Relevant to your expertise and desired role. Engage meaningfully with others, post, and add significant value through your presence on the platform. And I'll actually add some more onto that. 
when you start breeding yourself, like you say, as a sought after candidate, even if you're a person with no experience, like for example, the things that Destiny and I were talking about earlier before we got to this subject. If you're young, trying to get into cybersecurity, one of the questions they always ask is, hey, how do you keep up with cybersecurity news? So what you should probably do every day is every time it's a, a new breach or something out, you want to maybe fixate on one or the people who are behind these breaches. Shoot, you better get into your thread and tail bag and start breaking some of these things down and start posting about the breaches and what you would do and maybe how you could attack these from a security engineering standpoint, SecOps, IR, strategy, whatever you want to do. But you can start posting about stuff like that. And what eventually happen is, and while you're building up your LinkedIn, people start noticing that you have a knack for doing that. And whether it's the best like breakdown people have seen, the fact that you're doing it, one day I a uh, job you're going to apply to, you're going to see that hire manager views your page and he's probably going to ask you about these things in your interview. Or when it comes to maybe wanting to get a referral from somebody and they say, yeah, I'll refer you. I've been really you know, sitting back and seeing all the stuff that you've been writing about. So I, you know, we'd love to have somebody like you on the team. That's a way to actually get referrals. I already kind of show that you got value. But if you if I go to your page and I ain't, I'm not already following you and the first thing you do when you connect with me is saying, hey, are you hiring or can you refer me or all this other stuff? It's not going to work that good. You got to actually build it up like nobody just build a bridge in one day. It's, it takes baby steps. So you got to lay the foundation and then build that bridge to probably get in that referral. But once it's built, you should be good and, and make sure that network is always warm and make sure it's not just a one way transaction that like, I when recruiters reach out to me for a job or other people, if I'm asking them for something, I'm always saying, hey, if I can never do anything for you, please let me know. Or if it's a job, a recruiter reach out to me that I really don't, I'm not feeling or maybe not money not right. I'm like, okay, you know, it's not a good fit for me, but I do know if some qualified applicants I'm going to send me away. That's how I start building that bridge to where they think about me and say, hey, yeah, this was your range. You know, we had this open up, you know, let's, let's get on the call if you can. But you got anything to add to that, Des? Um, I think it's important to also um, be consistent. Like a, a lot of the times you you're looking for immediate interactions, gratifications, you know, comments, but be consistent with your post and eventually you'll be able to pick up that engagement piece. Um, so don't be afraid if no one likes it. It's OK. On and move onward and forward to the next one. This is not Instagram. Mm-hmm. And so this is kind of already touching on what I said, quality connections. So people that would be on the teams you want to work with, people that are industry leaders, even good content creators that, you know, you can see their work history and the things they talk about. If they got a big following, if they post a lot, that's where you're going to start like making your bones saying, listen, I'm going to tell you something that they're not going to say. Be controversial. Be as controversial as you can only then that's, you know, want like respect, but be controversial. Hot takes. Get people to come check out your posts. Say something outlandish. People, every listen, every time we make a video about the security plus, it get views. Know why? Because that is heralded to everybody about security plus. And I know exactly what I'm doing. If I title something about you don't need to get security plus or this or that, I know exactly what I'm doing. It's going to force a conversation for people to either say yay yeah or nay or saying maybe we need to kind of come back to this conversation and see what we need to do. Like when I'm always attacking A plus <laughs> and telling people, hey, you're trying to get inside of security, know the material in a sense, but you don't have to go waste money for that actual exam insert to get it. Because most of the jobs you look for when you're trying to get into cybersecurity will not have need of A plus on it. For sure. You're going to say. Especially yeah, in like, cyber. Skip it. Like you're going to rarely be touching hardware unless you're going to be at one of those companies where you're like the jack of all trades IT person. Yep. That's so. Let me see. Now, I'm going to see if I agree with this or not. Take time to focus on meticulously. meticulously tailoring every detail of your application from the research you do into each company to the keywords you insert throughout your resume to the examples you provide to support your application. You may only be able to apply for one or two roles a week, but this is more beneficial and laser focused than applying to several hundred within the same period. Ultimately, 
applying for hundreds of jobs has proven to be ineffective and is wasting your precious time. The golden range of 21 to 80 as cited in Zipia's study is not about numbers, it's about quality over numbers. Invest your energy and effort into improving your two important assets, your network and your portfolio of application documents. Remember, the success of your search isn't dependent on volume. Less is more. I actually agree. I, I agree on that. I don't agree that you got to tailor it for everything because some of your resumes may fit just that role that you're applying to. So I would not necessarily, necessarily say that you would have to tailor it for everything. But for the most part, I, I do agree with the keywords and speaking to what's on the job description, especially, like I said, if it's roles you're really interested in, do it. But see, what they didn't put in there that I tell you to do is, and I show you this with the group coaching or the one-on-one coaching, we go even past that. We go through, okay, we we headhunting. We're trying to find a hiring manager, somebody on the team, a recruiter. And there, there are tricks that I've learned through doing this that I can show you how to find these people that, that you know what I'm saying, they're not just saying, hey, I work for so-and-so. It's little tricks. You can find them in the job description. And like I said, if you do want to know about that kind of stuff, like getting a group coaching, get a tech resume or something like that, you get access for a year. But those are things that I show you that I've done that you can do that will at least lead to you getting a response or, you know, an interview eventually. I'm just saying. I think the one that you want to touch on after this was actually I've never uh <laughs> shout out to Care Tech man. Appreciate it. <laughs> but a slice of pizza. Let me see what some of these comments said. Um that's my guy, man. Listen, hey, speaking of, if you are trying to do uh help desk tier one, tier two, tier three, definitely go check out Care Tech Supports YouTube channel. I, I had a client oh, and a group coaching today. He reached out to me. He was ecstatic because he's been getting some interviews and stuff. And um, he has a tier two help desk interview coming up. I said, he said, how would I prepare for it? I immediately sent him Kevin's YouTube channel. He has pretty much all them questions they're going to ask you. He's broken them down. He got walkthroughs. He got labs. He got everything you would need on his YouTube channel. So you definitely should check that out. You have something to add this? Um, I was just saying, Ty Grant said, when I was searching, I made three different versions of my resume go. to match the role that I wanted. And yeah, that's very smart. Depending on how wide your skill set is, you may need to make more than that. But that is very wise to do. Yeah, I agree. You got three. Like, I got one that's a base. And then, like, for certain ones, I would do my first, last name, underscore the role whatever role it was or the company. And I would probably change certain things about it. Um, also guys, a free game. You sometimes, but I've seen in certain companies, you, the title of your job at your company is not a popular role amongst the industry. Like I had a, a guy, we got a console. We, we talked before, but he is like a security admin. And I was like, I would figure out what entails your role and, and map it to a more important term that's like more widely known versus saying a security admin. Cause I'm like, okay, what is a security admin? I was so just going to say it's broad. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you want to get specific and popular with your titles as possible. And, and that'll help you get a little bit more callbacks. And also if you live close to a bigger city, put the bigger city on there instead of your smaller city too, that that'll help you out as well. Especially if it's, you know, commuting distance. Because sometimes it was like, oh, this person don't stay in, you know, Dallas. They stay in Prosper. I'm like, put Dallas on there. It's a DFW. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, that's the key because those HR people go crazy with the controversy. Blackjack says, I lost my Udemy certificate on my resume for service. I studied, but didn't take official exam. Okay. Cool. I think we got to everything. Let me make sure I didn't miss nobody else. Okay, they're talking about some of the stuff we was talking about in the past. Yo, hey, shout out to my guys right here, man. Minutes Material Entertainment. Man, listen, they have like three or four podcasts on their channel. Now, the one I tune into the most is Homeroom University, and they critique like the popular podcast was like pop culture. And uh, they really be cooking like I ain't never even asked AJ this yet, but I'm like, whenever I'm out that way, I'm definitely going to see if I can make an appearance on the show. They out there, in, uh, I believe they're in Charlotte. 
So um, shout out to them. Let me see what my guy Kev said real quick. The issue I had with someone who did a call with me is that his resume was tailored to help desk cybersecurity. It's like very misleading. Do you want to wear help desk or security? Keep it simple. That that's it. Listen. Yeah. It too. Or I see somebody that is clearly they are doing help desk stuff, but they changed it to like security engineer or or SOC analyst or something like that. And I'm like, bro, I can see that that's not what you're doing at work. Like just change your title A go work is <laughs> not. You'd be better off finding somebody resume and putting their bullet points on there and, and hopefully being able to explain them in a in an interview versus what you're doing. Yep. But what I often find out doing all these consults is they are doing a lot of things that are cyber related that they're not aware of. Like I'm telling you, a lot of help desk people do a lot of identity access management and they are like, I am, and they don't know about it. I'm like, well, why would your boss know tell you you're doing identity access management? Because if they did tell you that, they don't have to pay you more. But because your job says help desk, service desk, desktop support, customer service, whatever it is, they know they don't have to pay you what you deserve to be paid. So that's why you got to always, you know, try to make sure you're not getting finessed. But let's let's cover that the TikTok stuff. I think that was pretty interesting. Um, I need, I want to see if I can find the part where they like kind of pass the vulnerability. All right, all right, all right. So we got celebrity TikTok accounts compromised using zero click attacks via DM. So popular streaming platform TikTok has acknowledged a security issue that has been exposed by threat actors to take control of high profile accounts on the platform. The development was first reported by Semaphore in Forbes, which detailed a zero click account takeover campaign that allows malware propagated via direct messages to compromise brand and celebrity count accounts without having to click or interact with it. So the exploit has been found to take advantage of a zero day vulnerability in the in the messaging component that allows malicious code to be executed as soon as the message is open. It's currently unclear how many users have been affected, although a TikTok spokesperson said that the company had taken preventative measures to stop the attack and stop it from happening again in the future. Um, the company further said that it's working directly with impacted account holders to restore access and that the attack only managed to compromise a very small number of users. It did not provide any specifics about the nature of the attack or the mitigation techniques it employed. And yeah, um, that these social media attacks are becoming more and more um they're becoming more and more prevalent. Bad actors are becoming smarter. Just simply opening up a message, not even clicking on anything, and the message is, is crazy. Very crazy. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think the article was like they fixed the... Uh, somebody said that was an inside job. Where's the article? Yeah, it says TikTok fixes zero day bug used to hijack high profile accounts. When, uh, what day was your article from? Do you do you know? This is from yesterday. Okay, dang it. So I guess I can probably figure out what they. Let me see something real quick. I'm just really trying to see what the fix was. Because most of the time, I know what other social media accounts and stuff like that. Like I know we're always hammering like, you know, MFA, MFA, MFA. But a lot of times that's really null and void because if they get you attacker gets you to click on something, they'll just steal your session. And um if you can't get back in within the time you need to, then like you get us done because they're gonna change your email to theirs and you're gonna have to wait on the support of the social media platform to eventually get your account back. Yep. Okay, let me nope, that's the one I was reading. Look at Forbes. Yeah. Um 
Hey, we'll move Pierce Hilton's account from the list of compromised accounts. Yeah, it ain't really, it ain't really saying too much about uh, whatever it was. So I, 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 the second article I read said that they declined to share more details about the nature of the tech or its countermeasures as to not tip off potential malicious actors. Bet. Um, so earlier we was talking about y'all, this y'all ain't gonna believe this, but like so the LA school district is investigating a data theft claim, and apparently they got access to like a lot of data. And get, the kicker is, guess how much they're trying to sell it for? Four million. <laughs> Way less. Let's see. Let me zoom in so make sure people can can see it on my end. So the LAUSD officials are investigating the third actors claiming that they're selling stolen databases containing records belonging to millions of students and thousands of teachers. LAUSD is the second largest public school district in the United States with over 25,900 teachers, roughly 48,700 other employees and more than 563,000 students enrolled during the 2023-2024 school year. The third actor selling the allegedly stolen data for a thousand dollars, bro. That's how you know it's a kid. What? That's a kid. Come on, bro. A thousand dollars. I'm trying to get a, a PS5 and um, you don't... the new NCAA. No, that's a script, kitty. No, no grown adult person is doing all that work for a thousand dollars. That reminded me like the people when they kept coming to steal from Target, they. What they'll do is some companies will just let you keep stealing to where you steal uh, so much that the amount is a felony so they can send you to prison versus you just getting <laughs> off with like, you know, a simple charge. So because attackers always come back to the scene of crime, they always do. It's just psychology. That's why psychology majors actually do well, pretty good when they come to cybersecurity because they already know, understand human action. So they says the thousand dollars says the CSV files put up for sale on the hacking form contain over 11 gigabytes of data, including over 26 million re- school records with students information, more than 24,000 teacher records and around 500 containing staff information. They also share two data samples containing roughly 1000 student records with social security numbers, addresses, parent addresses, email addresses. Like, look, like I say every day. Everybody just need aura because at least if this stuff was on the dark web, you'd already know before the school district let you know. Just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Researchers who analyzed these samples told Bleeping Computer that the sole data appears legitimate but could be old, as the data set does not include recent dates. However, the threat actor only shared a small sample of the allegedly stolen data, so there may be new information that's yet to be shared. Bleeping Computer contacted LAUSD earlier today to confirm the third actor's claims and was told that the public school district is now investigating them. We are looking into this and we'll get back to you if we have further information to share. LAUSD Public Information Officer Britt Vaughn told Bleeping Computer. I'm just hmm. I'm just so tickled. <laughs> I'm so tickled. A thousand dollars is crazy. As much data as they got for a thousand dollars, they got social security numbers. But if the data is old and they ask for a thousand dollars, I'm gonna be on the floor. I'm gonna be but on the, the floor. Is, to me, it wouldn't matter if it was old if I still got people's social security number. Same. I mean, very true, very true. But even that, this was funny. But it says so they were hitting 2022. I wonder if it's the same people. See, somebody said, lady, what happened? <laughs> somebody in the chat said that's the same as one like and I'll get drunk tonight. Then they say, good thing it's old social security numbers don't change. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, after the attack, LAUSD asked all employees, including teachers, support staff, and administrators to reset their LAUSD.net account credentials in person at district site and expedite the rollout of multi factor authentication. <laughs> Because they went and wrote already. Thank you. Right. And so that was that one. And then I think the, the last one that was related to uh, school systems was this right here. Let me share this one. 
Um, new fog ransomware targets U.S. education sector via breach VPNs. So this was pretty interesting to me. Arctic Wolf, shout out to Arctic Wolf. Fog was discovered by Arctic Wolf Labs, which reported that the ransomware operation has not set up an extortion portal yet and was not observed stealing data. However, Bleeping Computer can confirm the ransomware gang steals data for double extortion attacks using the data as leverage to scare victims into paying. Fox operators access victim environments using compromised VPN credentials from at least two different VPN gateway vendors. In each of the cases investigated, forensic evidence indicated that the threat actors were able to access victim environments by leveraging compromised VPN credentials. Notably, the remote access occurred through two separate VPNs. They kind of said at the beginning, once they gain access to the internet, I mean, once they gain access to the internal network, the attackers perform the pass the hash attacks on the administrator accounts, which are used to establish RDP connections to Windows servers running Hyper-V. Alternatively, credential stuffing is used to hijack valuable accounts, followed by P- uh, good old PSEZEC PS deployments on multiple hosts. On Windows servers, Fog operators disable Windows Defender to prevent notifications alerting the victim before the execution of the encryptor. When the ransomware is deployed, it performs Windows API calls to gather information about the system, such as the number of available logical processors to allocate threads for a multi-threaded encryption routine. Before starting the encryption, the ransomware terminates a list of processes and services based on hard-coded lists and uh, configurations. This is pretty interesting. It's a lot, but I'm going to try to get to the end. The ransomware encrypts VMDK files in the virtual machine storage and deletes backups from object stores in Veeam and Windows volume shadow copies to prevent easy restoration. So that's pretty sophisticated. Encrypted files are appended the .fog or .flop. This reminds me of a uh, with Kodak Black no flocking. <laughs> Though this could be set from JSON-based configuration, blocked anything the operator wants. Finally, a ransom notice created and dropped on the impacted directories providing instructions to the victims on paying for a decryption key that will help them get their files back. From an attack scene by Bleeping Computer, the ransom notice name readme.txt and contains a link to a Tor Dark website used for negotiation. This site is a basic chat interface allowing the ransomware victim to negotiate a ransom demand with threat actors and get a list of stolen files. <laughs> I'm chatting. I'm, I'm sorry, but the way that it looks is like such a joke in the notepad. Like it's... <laughs> Obviously, this is serious, but the way that it looks That's how they typically is, do it. yeah. But I'm childish because when I first read line one, if you're reading this, I immediately thought about if you're reading this, this is too late. And see, we call it says fog. We take responsibility. Okay, follow this link and the code. Down we click it. Say, if you're a decision maker, you will get all the details. <laughs> we are waiting for you. Because the thing is, here, here is the. The con is like, there's no honor amongst thieves. Just because I say I'm going to give your stuff back, don't mean I'm going to give it back to you. I could possibly we just saw keep that working. earlier. Mm-hmm. Yep. Even if we go back to the United Healthcare breach, where initially they paid out like the 20 million, the people they paid the 20 million to, one dude took the ran off with the 20 million and on the, the other plug. people didn't get the money. He yeah. ran off on the plug twice. So yeah, so that that's a that was a, I thought that was pretty interesting. I saw that happen for today, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> Her parents not doing enough for their child. <laughs> man, this these these people are crazy, man. But I thought that was pretty funny. Um, did you add them TikToks on there? Uh, did those come from I, you? Yeah. Yes. Let me. Okay, we're gonna try this out. I'm gonna see. Hopefully. Uh, let me see all right chat we're gonna see if y'all can hear this if y'all if y'all can't then hey but i'm gonna share the screen where is it oh there we go i had lost it for a second All right. Oh, man. This is funny. Look who you shared. The name tells me everything I need to know. <laughs> but all right, I'm going to hit play. Y'all let me know if y'all can hear this in the chat.
I really, I really wish this wasn't was an exaggeration. exaggeration. A university, university degree is absolutely not the way to start our career in technology, particularly in cybersecurity. Believe me, I've, I've looked into accreditation standards. standards. It's unbelievably arduous and expensive. Universities, universities don't have the finances to be, to be able to up date their curriculum regularly and still maintain their accreditation status. This means that they're operating on outdated technology. They're teaching you stuff that's decades old. That's not an exaggeration. I have a master's in cybersecurity and we were learning stuff on Windows XP. And this was as recently as 2022. The good news is if you did get your degree in cybersecurity, you can still get a job. The way that you do that is by doing exactly what you would do if you didn't have a degree. Start with your certifications, Network Plus and Security Plus. Learn your foundational skills in Linux, Python, and traffic analysis. Make an e-portfolio, a one-page resume, and apply to a thousand jobs. I've helped over 90 students start their careers in tech. My best student is making over $300,000 a year. Cybersecurity is the opportunity of your lifetime. It's happened before, and then it'll happen again. <laughs> Mr. Bowtie, cyber. Um, no. No. I don't agree. I got a degree in cybersecurity, so I don't agree. And I will say it depends on your school. Now, what he said wasn't a lie. Maybe that was his experience. Um, but the school I went to updates their curriculum based on the skill set that people are looking for today. The school that I went to didn't offer Python when I got my degree, but now it's a course because that's a sought after skill set. So it depends on your school. It depends on the faculty that work at the school. Who's running the school? Are they experienced? Are they in the field? You can absolutely sign up for a program that's going to take you nowhere where you're not going to learn anything, where you're learning things that could be old, but that's on you to do the research, to figure out why you should go to this school. Just like they determine if they want to accept you or not, you need to determine if that's the school that you want to go to, if that's the school you want to apply to or not, and do your research on it. So I don't agree with that. And I was offended that he even said that because I got a degree and look at me now. I ain't gonna lie. I just thought about uh, when you said that. I just thought about uh, the the late great Godfather and his. I got a PhD. I thought about that. <laughs> <sound. Yeah. laughs> uh, I ain't I ain't ISO the whole episode. Let me ISO real quick. So, bow tie cyber. Um, I say it's a nuance. I would say a degree can only help you not hinder you but i always say try to be smart enough about it i'm of the mindset now based on what i know about the job market i try to tell people if you got no experience whatever let's go around to get you like an entry-level it type of job whatever get to a decent company that may have some benefits where they can do some tuition reimbursement or at least you're getting paid more than you used to and try to pay as least as possible for that degree. Cause that's the one thing that's like the biggest thing. It's like now, like even me, like I had a plan, like I was at a company where they were supposed to do my reimbursement, but then I got laid off. So at that point, like I already knew the cost was going to fall on me for that master's. But I can say that, um, having my degrees has helped in my career because it, when there's been times to negotiate, they all look at my experience, sometimes certifications that look, most of them not current, but then my education and then they'll compare me to the peers in the role. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can do that on top of interviewing. Well, so it can help you in the long run. And then if you want to be in like some type of leadership position, if you have some type of higher education that can help you as well, most of the time, most managers or directors have some type of bachelor's, master's, some got PhDs. So you can see that. But this alternative, in theory, works, but it has to be worked more strategically. I've debunked so many times of him telling people in 90 days, go get a Splunk core user, um, and what he said, Network Plus, Security Plus, and AZ900. And build a portfolio with apply to a thousand jobs. We just saw that how that don't work was, and I like how he. Everybody does this too. His best students make it three hundred thousand dollars, which he's not seeing nine times out of ten they're possibly overemployed, which is fine. But don't seem like that person went with no experience 
and all of a sudden is getting paid three hundred thousand dollars. That's very disingenuous and misleading because everybody don't have time to get no four or five certs in 90 days. That take a lot of studying. Not only that, if you're getting them that fast, you're not retaining anything. So there are people like the exceptions of the rule do not make the rule. I'll just tell you at that. Like you, there are different ways you can get in. Matter of fact, I've been seeing apprenticeships being a little bit more popular nowadays too. So I would just say it's nuanced. I would say do what works best for you. I ain't going to tell you not to get some or get something. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to have something to help you stand out. And something that I didn't even bring up earlier when we were talking about applying to jobs on LinkedIn. If you use LinkedIn, you know, when you go to that company and you're looking for people to reach out to. If you got if you graduated, went to a certain school, it'll say, hey, these people went to your alma mater. And those are people that may refer you to just because y'all went to the same college. Just saying. So all in all, do what works for you, but don't necessarily. Don't necessarily like just not say do something just because you don't agree with it. it. It's many different ways to skin a cat. So yeah. that was, that was my I, take. I will say for me too, I joined the field with no experience. So for me, I personally feel like I couldn't have learned all the information that I learned in two years by myself. I don't, I don't think that would have happened. But someone in the comments said, do you think it would be beneficial to go back? And yes. And get a master's in cyber after being in a row. Yes, I do. I wish that, I know it sounds crazy, but I wish that I could go back now because things would make so much more sense to me. And I feel like I would gain more value from the program than I did initially because initially everything was just being thrown at me and not necessarily making the most sense because I had no experience. Um, so I I would say yes in that circumstance. But like you said, School isn't for everybody. That's not the only way. That was just the way that worked for me. Yeah. And then to piggyback off you, because me and her have pretty much the same alma mater. I just finished like, I don't know how many years I finished before you. December 2018, I was finished, but I didn't get my master's. So I was thinking like this. I didn't get my master's in cyber. I was already in cyber at the time. So I said, I'm going to get a master in a, a master's in a broader discipline. Cause it'll make me be more versatile in the chance that I need to do something different from cybersecurity. So my master's is, is an actually in technology management and a lot of the courses were not hard to me. They actually made a lot of sense because of stuff that I had seen at work. We did enterprise architecture. What else did we do? We did something that, 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 uh, what you call it was pretty cool, but we worked on different things. Like now, like I've had to come up with like statement of works before of like, if I want to do some consulting on our side and projects and, and deep dives to breaking things down and using data and all these different things. Uh, what we did like business analytics, whatever the class was, but it was a lot of stuff that made sense that I've had to do at work when I've been tasked with projects in various roles. And that's why I'm always so high on, I've said a lot of times I wish like bachelors were like masters in the sense that the syllabus like or curriculum makes more sense than giving you a lot of like all these different courses to take, but they don't translate over to your professional life. That's what I've been kind of wanting to get out of like bachelor degrees for a while. So there probably are some programs out there like that, but that's not most. And that's why some people go to college sometimes feel like they didn't learn anything because it's not specific enough to help them gear towards one area. And that's one of the issues people deal with when it comes to college. And that's why they struggle in interviews. And that's why they can't speak the things that they did because they feel like they learned too many th different things. And sometimes at the school, matter of fact, most of the time, they didn't even make them a good enough resume to help them out with that. Not just had a consult with a young lady not too long ago about she still was in college or her master's. And I'll say, uh, did they not, you know, help you with your resume and all this other stuff? And she was like, no, they didn't. It was like pulling teeth. I was like, that's crazy. I said, the career center, that's what they supposed to do. That's what they get paid for. So that's a, that's an even deeper topic to, to even go into when it comes to people really like feeling kind of like let down about like spending this money on this bachelor's. And so that's why I'm like, be as efficient as possible. Yes, you know, certain names matter on that degree. But hey, if you don't come for money, don't like go into debt just on a 
a whim of, oh, I went to, you know, this big school. I'm going to be, you know, doing this. Like, no, you got to have a plan and be very strategic on like what you plan to do after college. I want to chime in there because I honestly never even thought about getting a bachelor's because I have my master's in cyber. So I wasn't even thinking about someone going to get a bachelor's degree in cyber. And like you said, with those uh, gen ed courses, you got to take English, history, writing, all that kind of stuff. um, That is it directly in line. Whereas in a master's program, that's really what you're focused on. Like that one topic, concept, field, whatever it may be. Um, So in terms of a bachelor's, I don't, I can't guide you there, but in terms of a master's program, I would say it worked for me. And and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Right. And then the last thing we we'll probably do, it won't be the TikTok. And I thought I added this on the thing. I think I bookmarked it. So I probably could find it on my um my stuff. But today at uh, people who are on Twitter. I know y'all probably want to hear me go a little bit more in depth on this. So let me see if I can find it in my bookmarks. And yeah. Okay, cool. Here we go right here. (laughs) Okay. Let's do this, Johnny. All right. Let's present. Because funny enough, Kevin actually tagged me in this new post right here. So this guy, Mr. Tyrone, I know Erica Badu. Um, he said, uh, anybody interested in a career in cybersecurity? One even today it was actually two days ago, three days ago. I have a connection and she's looking for people to train and get into her boot camp. She also helps with resume building, mock interviewing and virtual labs and much more. Hit me if you're interested. So. He started off with this and I think, you know, I'm not, I'm going to cut him some bail. I think he meant well by it, but I don't know uh, how acclimated he is to Twitter, especially all the different scans of black tech Twitter. The fact that he kept on saying she, she, he could have said her name and it would help people out to figure out, okay, who is this person? Who is this she? Because we never heard of them. Like, it just sounds like another money grab for me, especially I mean, so many people burned by this boot camp word right here that people are always on, you know, like pretty much they're kind of always like, oh, no, it's another boot camp, guys, another, you know, another scam. And I'm not going to go through this whole thread. I'm just going to go to this flyer and why people even got more upset with it. Uh, Get tech with tech. Okay, breaking into cybersecurity. And then the overview is what is cybersecurity, cybersecurity roles, positions, certs you will need, how to land a job quick, registration fee, $30. Now, if this was in person, I probably wouldn't have, you know, a qualm about the 30 bucks because what is the $30 for? Because all these things I pretty much have answered in a, you know, a free live webinar on this page here. And I actually posted them all today. And so I was actually being funny. I posted my stuff and saying, hey, if you don't want to worry about who's that Pokemon, then check this one out. And I may pull that up if I can go find it. Anyways, uh, so this was that. And I think people just were kind of like off put by. And the other reason why it looks sketchy is because. This guy was on here, but I looked him up on uh, Twitter. I mean, not Twitter, LinkedIn. And he's actually a legit guy. Got a lot of experience. I actually wouldn't mind uh, having him on the show because he's uh, been doing auditing stuff for about seven, eight years now. But they should have had the chick on The here. person. I mean, she, exactly. Yes. She had the, you know, the less experience out of uh, everybody from what I saw. But, you know. I didn't never get a chance to even, I was so busy today. I didn't get a chance to even look at this link. And then, so I looked at the link finally and saw the people, I saw him and then I saw his company and stuff like that. And this is, I think it's actually sponsored by uh, their company where they're going to be, they offer like consulting services and stuff like that. But you should have saw like, let me see if this got any funny quotes. (laughs) Like, look at this. 
Literally, you could Google everything. So, yeah. And that's the thing, too, when it comes to, like, cybersecurity. is so many different roles you can do. And I think people just tired of being burned. Like, so the, the, the woman and the people behind this, they should actually come on Twitter or do a live stream and kind of like introduce themselves to Twitter and talk more because to the Twitter, they just seem like random people. And the way he said, Oh, they're trying to train people and put them in a boot camp. We've seen this play too many times. And so you're not going to be able to get that one off because when he says she, and then you go to the thing, you said this person, people are like, what's going on here? Are these people finna just run off of my registration fee? So that's yeah, what a lot of people felt like it was given. See? I just, I don't, the flyer is, the flyer is horrible. First of all, let's you start so? there. Yeah. Get tech with tech. What does that mean? Breaking into cybersecurity is one word. Now, you know what? You're right. The spacing is off. It is, it, it's given, don't. Pay the $30. The spacing is off. Let me try to find my tweet because I want to laugh at myself. I think I'm so funny sometimes. <laughs> oh, here it is. Right here. I found it right here. Uh let me let me share it with y'all. Yeah, so I'll post it at today. And I said, check this out before you pay the 30s or who's that Pokemon. And only probably millennials and maybe some Gen Z people get that reference. Um, and then I posted this if you need some resume help. So, like, I got a lot of free stuff on here. So a lot of times, too. And I'm just saying this as a, a person that sometimes asks me about, like, oh, he's trying to sell some this or that. So I didn't give y'all so much free game away. Like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so I got anything like people will come in my comments a little shysty sometime on YouTube. And I'm like, well, how you look through my page before you say like the stuff you say? They'll say, oh, you only complain and you didn't even gave them the solutions. I'll say, well, research and see what you find and come back. But yeah, this is the thing that used to come on. Who's that Pokemon? So hopefully y'all get it. You know, I know y'all stepping your knees right now. Hands on your knees. Hands on your knees. <laughs> but Men that's always typically in the episodes off with like a movie line or something that's uh living through their head or it can even be on a show. Uh I was looking up the Jackson's American Dream the other day just because she was doing that Catherine part. <laughs> Love uh, Catherine. What 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 line you got on your on your mind tonight? Um I've actually been, um, so my bachelor party is next week. So I've been on my 90s movie kick and like cracking jokes with my friends and the Players Club is in my head. Um, when the cousin was in the bathroom um, dressed inappropriate, no, when the cousin was in the house dressed inappropriately in front of her cousin's boyfriend and her cousin Lance. came home, and <laughs> Lance, and she was like, you ain't gonna put nothing on? And then Ebony was like, for who? Lance? He ain't nobody. And then lo and behold, she ended up in that bathroom on the floor, scrunched in the corner, scared because she knew Diamond was going to bust her head open for messing with Lance. So she was walking around the house in her undergarments when she shouldn't have been because it was inappropriate. And she pretty much tried to act like it wasn't a big deal. But lo and behold, she was actually messing with her cousin man on the slick on the sly. So yeah, <laughs> if you ain't seen the movie. They probably seen that. Then it made me think about uh <laughs> that movie's stupid because uh is it? it's so stupid. The the actor that played Ezel, when he said, uh, anybody ever told you that wasn't him? Or was it? That was no, him. that was Ezel. That was him. That was him. When he said, anybody ever tell you like the father from Good Times? <laughs> <laughs> and he put that uh maybe put like a donut or something in his pocket, or oh no, that movie's stupid. Uh I think I've been thinking about like stupid stuff from like uh, rush hour, like oh yeah, it's probably me. Um, uh, I plan to uh actually probably replace this mic. To be honest, uh, I think I used to have my settings changed, but I'll, I'll adjust it. I think for me, I got to hit him with that uh. 
Chris Tucker on Rush Hour 2. Uh, if y'all not familiar, him and Jackie, they they get tied up by the triads. And then he he's acting, he's asking Jackie, like, what's gonna happen while they in the back of the 18 wheeler thing? And he's like, Oh, well, they will do this and they will cut off your egg rolls. Cut off my egg rolls, like all that stupid stuff. And then uh so they the, the, the thing stopped. And so they finally, while they in the truck, like Lee is biting the um the rope and tell my use them tiger teeth. <laughs> so when the man opened up the back door, he come in there, he looking. And then Lee say, I'll tell you what happened. And then that's what uh that's when what you call it. No, Carter say that. I'm sorry, I've been saying Lee. Carter says that, and then Lee is uh Lee takes out the uh the dude. <laughs> man, I don't, what'd he say? Lee, why you tell me that man roll like that? I did. I said, mm, what that mean? I go this way, you go that way. <laughs> <laughs> I go this way, you go that way. I, I just need, I would like them to make, I think they're going to probably make one more for uh, the simple fact that Will Smith and uh, Martin Lawrence have just concluded Bad Boys. So I think we'll get Rush Hour 4 some type of way. I'm going to see uh, Bad Boys this weekend. So, yeah. I don't know when I'm going to see it, but I plan on seeing it too. Because I enjoyed number three. I know a lot of people like number three, but I was happy. I was happy to see it. I, I was happy to see it too. I thought it was a good a good way to do number three after so many years. Yeah. Um, you got any last words for the audience today? Hmm. I don't got nothing too fancy today. Everybody have a good weekend and don't get nothing on you. And make sure you tune in to the next episode. Like, subscribe, follow us on social media, and make sure you subscribe to the Patreon. That's all I got. And I was going to hit him with that, uh, the last part from uh, Wishar when he left out, uh, <laughs> when he left out with, uh, what's my boy name, Don Cheeto? He said, I shoot you and say you uh, slipped in the kitchen. <laughs> but uh, when he left, he said, um, um, we, um. Uh, Constant. <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate everybody for tuning in, man. Uh, this will be on Apple Music and I mean not Apple Podcasts or Spotify sometime this weekend. So if you want to listen to it while you're going to work or something. But yeah, man, y'all know what to do. Run up these views and share it out. We out.